Are the US and Russia headed for a nuclear arms race? Trump and Putin are fighting over weapons and it could send their countries back to the days of the Cold War. I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is Washington and Moscow's nuclear arsenals. The Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty ended the US and Russia's arms race during the Cold War. At the time, Moscow and Washington warned that not abiding by the deal could have catastrophic consequences. Well, that might happen in February. Most experts say Russia has been violating the pact for years by building missile systems that could reach further than limits set in the treaty. So the Trump administration has told the Kremlin to make a U-turn or it'll rip up the agreement. Some reports say the Pentagon already has orders to develop and deploy ground-launched missiles at the earliest possible date. And theories are flying about what's behind the aggression, from conspiracies that both countries want to build weapons that could contain China, to tensions over a probe into alleged Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election. We'll get into all of that in just a moment, but first, here's Natalie Perhernan. The US and Russian administrations are engaged in a war of words. And that's nothing new. Except this time it could mean the end of a Cold War-era treaty that's meant to keep the world safe. In 1987, the then US and Soviet Union leaders signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty to limit nuclear arms. It means that for the first time, the Soviet Union agreed to destroy weapons they already had. The treaty bans the possession, production, and flight testing of ground-launched cruise and ballistic missiles, which can travel between 500 and 5,500 and kilometers. But now, the US says Russia's development of the Novator 9M729 missile violates the treaty, and it's given Moscow 60 days to comply. The U.S. says this is the final attempt at a diplomatic solution before it unilaterally withdraws from the treaty. Russia's actions gravely undermine American national security and that of our allies and partners. It makes no sense for the United States to remain in a treaty that constrains our ability to respond to Russia's violations. NATO has also joined the U.S. in calling out Russia for violations. But it is urging calm. We seek dialogue not confrontation with Russia. We don't want a new arms race. We don't want a new Cold War. Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country has not broken the treaty and that the US is looking for a way to get out of it. Мы против разрушения этого договора, но если это произойдет, соответствующим образом будем реагировать. Tensions have been rising since October when US President Donald Trump first raised the prospect of withdrawing from the accord. He's also said the US will expand its nuclear arsenal until people come to their senses. Putin has responded in kind, saying there must be reliable protection for the Russian motherland. For now, there seems to be no end to the verbal sparring. We never had any response from the Americans to our suggestions on the treaties. We remind them about this from time to time, but the answer is the same. You should correct your mistakes and eliminate violations that you have committed. Adults don't talk this way. In the past, Moscow and Washington DC have come back from the edge of an arms race. But will this ultimatum help their current leaders keep the peace? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Let's go to our panel now. Former Kremlin advisor Alexander Nekrasov joins me from London. And former Assistant Secretary of Defense Larry Korb is in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Larry Korb, let me begin with you. Is the U.S., the Trump administration, correct in wanting to pull out of the INF? No, it's not. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that Russia has been uh, violating the treaty, but the best thing to do is to negotiate with Russia uh, over what these uh, disagreements are, as well as extend the New START agreement to tw uh, that expires in 2021 and see what you can, uh, what you can work out. 
But if you get out of it, you will legitimize what Russia is doing. They're claiming they're not violating it. So if you get out, then they can go, go ahead uh, with uh, continuing to develop uh, these uh, weapons, which are a violation of the treaty. Alexander Nekrasov, Larry Korb says there's no doubt that Russia is violating this treaty. Is that how you see it? Well, uh, the American side always uh, says, like, uh, says that, and uh, without uh, many facts, they, uh, they are c claiming that Russia is violating this or violating that. If you recall how they uh, went out of the ABM treaty in 2002, they simply made up a pretext that they need the, the systems, uh, anti-ballistic missile systems, because of a rogue state. They knew perfectly well that the so-called rogue states like North Korea or Iran, they didn't even have the capability to attack the United States. But they insisted that, no, they have to build this protective shield to protect Europe, to protect themselves. It was a blatant lie, but they did it. And they, I think uh, the ABM Treaty was one of the cornerstones of uh, international security and nuclear disarmament, and uh, they just simply walked away. So they are doing it exactly in the same manner. They are also saying that because China is not in this treaty, that's why it's worthless. Mm -hmm. It's not. China could have been joining this treaty, and that's a very simple way out. Okay, uh, and that's, but uh, that's no, I don't see any logic in yeah, this. Yeah, and that's interesting. And you bring up an interesting point because Larry Korb, a lot of people feel that these agreements are completely obsolete. During the Cold War, yes, it was the Soviet superpower and the United States as a superpower up against each other. All this time, the Chinese were impoverished, right, and building themselves up. So whether it's INF and these ground-based nuclear missiles, medium range, or it's New START and the long range ones, whatever that may be, the context is very different in 2018. The Chinese have been doing their own thing because they've not been bound by any treaty. So both the United States and Russia have to start again, have to think of a new reality. Isn't that the truth, Larry Korb? Well, there's no doubt about the fact <clears throat> that China has developed these uh, intermediate nuclear, nuclear forces, and some people have used that as an argument for us getting out of it. But really, we don't need to deploy those type of weapons uh, in the Pacific. We've got enough uh, weapons on our uh, ships there to, to deal with the situation. But I do agree that we should now bring China into the negotiations, as well as other countries like Iran and, uh, and North Korea, because they're developing this capability uh, as well. It's not as critical for the intercontinental ballistic missile, because it's really only us and Russia. And I agree with uh, my colleague here. We shouldn't. We didn't need to get out of the ABM treaty. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the person who drove that was John Bolton, who was then in the State Department under President Bush. And he's the one that's trying to undermine these arms control agreements now because he just doesn't believe in arms control. Mm -hmm. Let me bring in Thomas Callender now, who's in D.C., a senior research fellow at the Conservative Heritage, Fund Heritage Foundation who focuses on naval warfare. Thomas... You heard some of what preceded you. Are these treaties worth saving, such as the INF, or should the U.S. just get out? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think arm, you know, arms, effective arms control is in the U.S. and uh, the world's best interests. However, uh, to be effective, you know, both parties must comply uh, to that, and they have to be enforceable. Um, going forward on this. Right now, the U.S. is the only nation prohibited and complying with its obligations from developing and fielding intermediate range uh, conventional uh, ground-launched uh, crews or ballistic missiles. And we're ceding a significant military advantage to not only Russia, but China, North Korea, Iran, to be able to defend ourselves and our allies. Alexander Nekrasov. The opinion from the United States, where Larry and Thomas, I guess, slightly disagree, but agree on the fact that the Russians are cheating, is that Russia's been getting away with murder, I guess, over the past few years. And why can't that be the reality, that that's what Russia's doing? It's cheating on this, and it's developing these missiles because it doesn't quite care about the treaty. Doesn't the United States then have every right to say, well, we're not going to play ball anymore? Well, it's a, it's a very simple thing to accuse another side 
but there are inspections, there, there are satellite uh, observation, surveillance. You can easily, easily find out what is going on. The American side and the, and the West generally, they're always saying things that are happening around the world in Syria, Ukraine, whatever. They forget that the satellite surveillance is now everywhere. It's very difficult to avoid detection when you are actually in, uh, uh, sort of conducting some sort of a huge program which can be detected. I mean, the inspections were going on. So, so all of a sudden, all these inspections are useless. Now, I think, you know, the problem with the West, generally, is that they don't understand one simple thing. The World War Three is going to be a nuclear war. And the, all the world leaders, all the uh, Western world leaders need to understand something. They will not get away from it. They will not escape. They will not have time to reach the bunkers they've built for themselves. And they, if they understand that, they will be completely different in their attitude. Right. They will Talking, stop okay. the lying game. Okay. They will stop the blaming okay, game. Okay, Mr. Nekrasov. So when Russia sent those two nuclear-capable bombers to Venezuela following Venezuelan President Maduro's visit to Moscow about a week ago, <clears throat> what sort of message was Putin trying to send to the West? Well, these messages are sent by everyone. America sends their bombers and their... Uh, they're patrolling along the uh, Russian borders and so on. These are all symbolic gestures. They are technically diplomatic gestures with a military muscle added to it. There's a lot of confusion in the public uh, perception than when some submarine uh, goes somewhere or a ship. They never enter, by the way, the territorial waters of any country, but it immediately implies that it is some sort of show of strength and so on. These things are done by everyone. It's just like spying, you know? They're trying to show that Russia is the only one that spies on others, forgetting that America, Britain, Germany, France are spying on Russia all the time. So it's, it's a mutual game. We have to stop this one-sided, double-standard approach. Everybody does things that are sometimes not great things, you know, that are not, shouldn't be probably done. But it, it happens. That's the real world. But I, again, I stress, the world leaders need to understand the end will come to everyone, and them included, in World War III. Thomas Callender, on that very jovial note, I guess, <laughs> are we... I mean, is this the beginning of a new arms race? Because people talk of this all the time, but is, is this the real deal this time around? I mean, so I don't think it's the beginning of a new arms race. I think it's uh, an arms race that has already been going on. Uh, this, the U.S. has been prohibited uh, from participating or responding uh, to these increasing threats uh, by our maintaining our obligations to the INF Treaty. Mm -hmm. I mean, Russia, in this case, right, has already fielded several battalions of the uh, 9M729 ground launch cruise missile. China has deployed you know, hundreds of intermediate range uh, ground launched ballistic and cruise missiles that uh, threaten the U.S. and our Indo-Pacific allies. Uh, Iran, North Korea are, are working very rapidly to develop uh, increasingly long range uh, missiles. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it actually in the that's already been going on. The U.S. getting coming out of the treaty mm -hmm. and being able to uh, field uh, ground launch versions of some already air and sea launch cruise missiles we have, I think would uh, hopefully send the appropriate message to Russia that um, and bring them back to the table to negotiate uh, an updated INF that is more enforceable. Um, look back to, you know, the 80s with the original INF treaty. It wasn't until the U.S. deployed the Pershing twos in Europe that brought Russia to the table uh, to negotiate in the first place. So I don't think it, it's an arm race that's already been going on, and the U.S. and our allies around the world are at a distinct military disadvantage right now. Larry Corb, you mentioned uh, Mr. Bolton and what he likes to do, get out of a lot of these um, uh, global institutions that the United States has signed up to. Is that at the heart of all of this? Is it just politics, and does it have nothing to do with weapons whatsoever. People look at the track record of the Trump administration, getting out of the Iran nuclear deal, getting out of the Paris Climate Accord, getting out of NAFTA and TPP and so on and so forth. This is just the weapons version of it. 
They don't want to have anything to do with it, no more, no less. Well, it's a combination of uh, uh, Ambassador Bolton and uh, President Trump. He does not like any agreements negotiated by any of his predecessors, whether it's the Iran nuclear deal or uh, the, uh, the, 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 cl the climate, climate, climate accords. So that's one factor. And then, of course, Ambassador Bolton, as I mentioned, he wanted us to get out of the ABM treaty. He doesn't like the uh, <clears throat> INF treaty. He doesn't want to extend New START. Now, let me make an important point here. The most dangerous thing is not these intermediate weapons. It's the long-range ballistic missiles. And the Russians have not only been keeping to that treaty, where we have intrusive inspections, but they want to extend it. And I mm -hmm. don't understand why this administration won't extend it, because that's working. And by the way, this whole thing about the INF, George Shultz, who was I had the privilege of working with when I worked for Ronald Reagan, he says what they're doing now is the wrong thing to do. You ought to go back to the negotiating table, work on it. And this thing about all these other countries, we have sea-launched ballistic uh, intermediate weapons that can deal with any of these uh, any of these threats. And this whole idea now, I, as I mentioned before, you should have a you're going to have a new arms agreement. I think it would be great to bring China in, in, primarily bring China into it. But this whole idea that you do this and it's going to improve security. Listen to George Schultz. He worked for Ronald Reagan. He was part of negotiating this. And this is what he says. Yeah, on the flip side, Thomas Callender, let me get your opinion on this. There are those who said, well, OK, it was all well and good and symbolic that Obama and Mr. Medvedev got together and they agreed to shave off a few hundred nuclear weapons here and there, but both of them still had thousands of nuclear weapons, and both countries still spent billions of dollars in maintaining and upgrading their nuclear arsenals. So the status quo was just a facade to make it seem as if we're not on the verge of complete annihilation, but was that really the reality? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I agree that, you know, obviously it is the, at the, a world level, um, right, the, inter, the intercontinental, both uh, sub-launched and uh, air and land-launched uh, cruise mi uh, missile, ballistic missiles, nuclear missiles, are uh, the biggest uh, I threat to, to the world in that regard. And I agree. As far as we know, Russia is still in compliance with New START. Um, they've been, although they and the Chinese have been rapidly modernizing their nuclear forces, uh, the U.S. is fine in, in a position where we have to do some modernization of our uh, strategic nuclear forces. But if you look at, at, at Russia's stated uh, military strategy regarding the tactical nuclear weapons, of which uh, this deployed miss, ground launch cruise missile can be one, um, they've repeatedly stated that if a war erupts in, in Europe, they will use tactical nuclear weapons uh, to achieve an effect. And right now, um, the U.S., we don't, we don't even have something that could be a deterrent of an, mm -hmm. an equivalent response. Okay. We got rid of all our tactical nukes, right. and so I think bringing this back, this possibility, actually will further deter Ru Russia from using them. Okay, so very finally, Alexander Nekrasov, does the United States have the right to want to defend itself in Europe, on the European mainland, from Russian tactical nukes? Well, I think the United States and NATO well, countries uh, have made a crucial mistake by moving their forces to the Russian border. I think a lot of problems have arisen from the fact that NATO uh, moved eastwards very quickly. It is now on the borders with Russia. That is absolutely outrageous. That changes the whole pattern of uh, a possible conflict uh, on the European territory. I think the Americans and the Westerners generally have created this dangerous situation when Russia will have no other choice but to use nuclear weapons, tactical ones. The Americans, if the Russians would have done the same and moved their troops to their borders, let's say in Mexico, the Americans would have probably started a nuclear war. So excuse me, it's very rich of the American representatives to say how they're going to defend themselves when they have their troops too close, way too close to the Russian borders in Europe. So that's the main problem. They need right. to think very carefully what they're doing in Europe. OK. And we don't have time to get into that, but maybe next time. Gentlemen, Alexander Nekrasov, Larry Korb and Thomas Callender, I appreciate you joining us here on The Newsmakers.
Coming up on the Newsmakers, could Kosovo start a war just by getting an army? And could the famous Stanford prison experiment be bunk? We asked the psychologist behind the research. Kosovo is preparing to create a standing army in defiance of Serbian objections and those who say it's unconstitutional. Supporters say the country already has a military and should be able to defend itself from its northern neighbor, Serbia. But opponents argue it's one more step towards the ethnic cleansing of Serbian enclaves there. The Kosovo parliament is expected to pass legislation on Friday, but it's doubtful that the matter will be settled. With more here, Shoaib Hassan. Two decades after the end of war in the Balkans, fears of conflict between Serbia and Kosovo are returning. That since Kosovo unveiled plans to upgrade its security force into an official standing army. The move enjoys the support of a majority of Kosovars, and after the government approved a draft law in October, Parliament is expected to ratify it in a vote on December the 14th. But ethnic Serbs in Kosovo fear such a force could be used to target them. Despite the reassurances, the move is opposed by Serb representatives in Kosovo's parliament and has drawn a furious reaction from Serbia. Serbia's Prime Minister Anna Brnovic has even said it could provoke a military intervention to protect Serbs in Kosovo. It's a bit of deja vu for the region. That was the centre of a civil war in which the Albanian Muslim majority Kosovo broke away from Serbian control in 1999. That was after NATO intervened, following increasing reports of human rights violations by the Serbian army that had launched a brutal crackdown to crush local insurgents. Human rights groups accused the Serbs of massacring civilians in the conflict, which eventually claimed more than 13,000 lives. It ended after Kosovo was placed under a UN mandate in 1999, and it declared its independence nine years later in 2008. Serbia protested against the move, but a NATO force that remains stationed in Kosovo has deterred Belgrade from any aggression. Since then, both sides have moved to improve relations. The latest example being a proposed territory swap between the two sides. Such talks have been facilitated by the EU, which insists Serbia and Kosovo settle their differences before entering the Union. Serbia still considers Kosovo a breakaway province after the two countries split in 1999. The proposed territory swap seeks to exchange the Serb-dominated Mitrovica region in Kosovo for the Prisevo Valley in Serbia that is Almanian Muslim. But the talks have stalled after protests from both sides. One source of the dispute is the Ghazi Wode Lake, which is prized by the Kosovo Serbs and the Albanian Kosovars as the main source of water in the country. It's a single example of the many disagreements that make any rapprochement difficult. And since then, things have deteriorated. Serbia blocked a move to accept Kosovo into Interpol, and in retaliation, the Kosovan leadership has imposed a 100% duty on Serbian goods. It seems to have led both sides back to a state of insecure coexistence, but things could get worse if Kosovo raises an army. We discussed Kosovo's intention to move ahead with the transformation of the Kosovo security force into an army. Such a move is ill-timed. With a strong NATO force already in the country, does Kosovo really need to create such an army? And is Serbia's reaction just saber-rattling? Or is peace in the Balkans once again falling apart? Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, we're joined in Pristina by Libun Aliu. He's a Kosovo MP representing the Vetevendosje party. And finally, from Belgrade is Darko Trifunovic, a research fellow and lecturer at the Faculty of Security Studies at Belgrade University. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Libun, let me begin with you. Why do you need an army? 
Each sovereign state should have uh, the right for self-collective defense, and therefore uh, we need an army. It is a, a constitutive element of a sovereign state, sovereign and independent state. That's why right. it's uh, elementary. And not every country has had the history that Kosovo has had, especially since it's not too long ago. So with that in context and that in mind, do you accept why this might not be the best time to decide to push for an army? Well, army? well uh, uh, in the past, in the past, there have been examples of limitations uh, on some states that have, let us say, have been aggressors. But Kosovo has never attacked any other state. And on the contrary, we have been colonized by Serbia for about 100 years. And mm -hmm. there is very difficult to find any argument uh, that can support the idea of preventing Kosovo from having its own standing army for collective self-defense. Darko Trifunovic, the KSF already is an army in all but name. So why not formalize it into something that is called an army? First of all, you can see our colleague from Pristina. He's standing and sitting behind Albanian, not the Kosovo flag. So he is very contradictor. And if we are creating another Albanian state in Europe, we are very wrong. First of all, uh, Albanians in Kosovo, they cannot have army illegally. If they want to have army, of course, okay. But according to their constitution, Army is not the mention. So okay. But it's up to them some... whether they want to change the constitution or pass it through parliament no, without changing they... the constitution. It's their business, isn't it? No, no, they are not alone. I'm sorry to say it's not up to them. They are not living alone in Kosovo. There is Roma people, there is a Serbia people, and Kosovo is not the sovereign state because sovereign state is a member of the United Nations. So once when Kosovo becomes sovereign state and member of the uh, United Nations, then we can talk further, right. but in this, Certainly. this moment, we need to talk about peace. But forever, to okay. talk about uh, allow me for a second, Darko. For the foreseeable future, a country like Russia would, would never allow them to become a fully-fledged state according to the United Nations in that respect. So what, are they going to be in limbo forever? Russia, there is a country like China, and also I think Turkey, if Turkey, uh, Turkey need to think and reconsider decision to recognize Kosovo, because I understand that Turkish recognition of Kosovo, it's a brave step forward in order to, to uh, tomorrow, Turkey will recognize Kurdish state on its own territory. <laughs> okay, that was quite a leap. That was an interesting one. I mean, I know you were thinking about that for a long time before you came onto the program. So, okay, credit to you. It's quite a leap, but I want to stick to the topic here. Libun Aliyu, we look at the fears of the Serb minority and, and Darko, mentioned something that is quite tangible and quite real. There's a heavy history, and I remember going to North Mitrovica especially, a lot of the ethnic Serbs there felt that at any given point, the ethnic Albanian majority wants to wipe them out. Whether that's real or perceived, wouldn't an army just make those things worse and heighten those fears of the Serb minority in Kosovo? Well, uh, uh, if we would look at history recently in 2010, and in actually in 2000, uh, from the northern part of Kosovo, there has been expelled about 10,000 Albanian citizens. Uh, while the Kosovo army would be the, the norm that will, that will bring peace and uh, it will be to provide security for all citizens of Kosovo. And uh, uh, we believe we believe that uh, that Kosovo's path toward full liberal integration will where NATO can play the security role. And in this aspect, uh, uh, the army of Kosovo will be a defensive, defensive mm -hmm. army that can just bring, bring peace to the, to, the, to the region and also to, the, to bring the peace, to bring peace and security also for the, for the uh, Serbian citizens in the northern part of Kosovo or in the same way as in the southern part. Okay, so Dako, you have an opposition politician here saying that they have no interest in attacking the Serbian minority in Kosovo. Why don't you believe him? Look, it's not what I believe or not. I am in favor that we shall sit, talk, negotiate. Uh, now it's time for peace, not for any kind of aggressive statements, not of uh, kind of anything aggressively. But we can see whenever you have internal problem in Pristina, 
Pristina's authorities are uh, all the time by default, they go violent. So we need to come down and see what we can to do uh, on the benefit of all people residing in the Balkan, not only in Kosovo, Serbia and elsewhere, definitely a number of countries that they are withdrawing their recognition of Kosovo is growing. And Kosovo, if, is, if this continue like this, the basic problem, which bother me a lot, that young people from Kosovo, they going to leave. They not going to wait any kind of decision tomorrow. They want decision now. And that's exactly what Kosovo uh, politicians, current Kosovo politicians, that most of them, they supposed to finish as war criminal. They are not credible to, uh, to So we need a new generation of Kosovo, as well, maybe in Serbian politicians. I don't want to say okay. nothing uh, against Kosovo, that I, I don't right. say something against Serbian. So, we need maybe new generation, we need new approach. We need a new, uh, let's say, energy in the region without this guy that he's now getting okay. Šešek, these radicals from Serbia. Serbia. We don't need them. Okay, although, we don't need them. although a lot of young people support having their own sovereign independent army. I just want you to have a little listen, Darko, to General Zaimer Halimi. He's called a general in the KSF. I spoke to him a year ago when we did Crossing the Line in Kosovo. Have a little listen to what he told me. Our final goal is to transform the Kosovo security force into an army. That's when I think our mission will be accomplished. You know, Darko, when I spoke with him, when I spoke with General Halimi, and we did a tour of the, the KSF uh, base, ultimately they saw it as an inevitability. They trained with the help of NATO and Western forces, and eventually, Western and NATO forces must leave and they can take over their own security. As a Serb, isn't it better to have Kosovo Albanians, Kosovo Albanians with their own army rather than NATO at your doorstep? If they don't respect their own constitution and there is no word, if they don't respect their own rules, so how, who will believe them? And if they want army, they have Albanian army. As I said, see our colleagues from Pristina, he's sitting nearby Albanian flag. Not the Kosovo flag. I only see you a red see background. Now. I don't see a flag. I only see a red background. I don't see a flag. Just, you can see near him, it's Albania, not the Kosovo flag. Just let him to move a little bit and you will see. <laughs> now okay. there is no. Okay. Now there okay. is no. But it was Albania flag, okay. not the Kosovo flag. Okay. So, so, okay. Okay. Hold on. So there's a bunch of things to unpack here, right? All over, all over Kosovo, undoubtedly. Okay. Certainly all over Kosovo, undoubtedly. There's a Kosovo flag and there's an Albanian flag, which is... <laughs> attached to an ethnic identity, which is also a flag of another country. That's another whole thing to deal with here. But let me ask Liburn to address the issue of if you guys can't respect your own constitution, why should Darko respect and believe you? It's in your constitution not to have your own army. Why are you pushing for this right now then? Kosovo, Kosovo Port is getting advanced. It is the same, remaining in the same uh, structure as it was. It's just, just getting advanced in... in uh, in, uh, let us say, more, more aspects and concerning the sovereignty, concerning the sovereignty. And also I, what I would like to mention is that, uh, yes, about the dialogue, we have been having a dialogue and we are still, I think, in a way to continue the dialogue with Serbia. That is the main thing in relation between Kosovo and Serbia. Since 2011, we are having a dialogue and we had about 33 agreements that has been made. And none of them has been fully respected by Serbia, and most of them are not being respected at all. And uh, let's just mention about uh, that recently, this year, this year has started with the assassination of Oliver Ivanovic. Yes. So the entire, uh, uh, let us say, attempt for worsening relations is uh, is coming from from Serbia. Uh, no one from Albanian has been uh, accused about this assassination. There Serbia, are about four but, Serbs but been arrested. Okay. But Liber, the, the ethnic Serbs of North Mitrovica saw the assassination of Oliver Ivanovic yes. as a possible sign of them being wiped out, not the other way around, right? I spoke to them. That's well, the thing. Both well, sides are well, saying this is a sign well, of the other well, side going well, extreme. Let, let us remember that Oliver Ivanovic was opponent, opponent right. to to Vucic and to the government in in, uh, in Serbia. And uh, there is also an attempt for a, for a journalist who came to find out what happened, mm -hmm. but has, he has been also attacked and, uh, and uh, ended up in, in hospital. But what I should mention also that 
This year, there has been a visit from Vucic in, the, in Kosovo. And uh, what he declared that was uh, very interesting, he praised, he praised Milosevic and he called him as a great leader who make few mistakes. Mm. And uh, these kinds of declarations are, that are giving a very, very bad signal right. toward the. Uh, Okay, so let me Kosovo. ask Darko. Darko, isn't it more of a provocation when Vukic says things like Milosevic was a great leader who just made some mistakes? Isn't that more of a provocation than Kosovo deciding to formalize an army? Um, I agree uh, with our Albanian colleague. We don't need any provocation. But just comparing president of Albania, he visits Serbia and nobody... We lost you for a second there, Darko. We're going to come back to Darko in a second. We're going to, we're going to try and stabilize that. Let me, ask, let me ask Liban something else here. Let me bring in NATO, yes. right? So we lost, we lost Darko for a second. We'll bring him back in a second. Liban, let me bring in NATO here, yes. right? So NATO is your ally. Forget the Russians, forget the Serbs. Jens Stoltenberg, NATO's Secretary General, describing the idea of creating the Kosovo army, saying such a move goes against the advice of many NATO allies and may have serious repercussions for Kosovo's future Euro-Atlantic integration. This is NATO. These are not your enemies. They're saying it's a bad time. Yes, yes, but also there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, declarations from states, that, uh, from different states that uh, support in a way that said that Kosovo has a right, has a right to have its own army. And uh, therefore, therefore uh, let us think if, uh, let us do an analy uh, to analyze a bit, our neighbors, our neighbors and their declarations around, they all have armies. They have the right to have armies. Why shouldn't Kosovo has a right to have an army? And uh, although that would be a defensive army, that will be a, an army that will have just a collective, just a collective self-defense, mm -hmm. a meaning on the, on the bottom of, on the right. bottom of it. Okay. So in this, in this aspect, in this aspect, there is no threat to any kind of, uh, uh, let us say, peace and uh, and security in the in the in the Balkans. Darko, we have you back. Darko Trifunovic, come in. Yes, I'm with you. So um, what I want to say, uh, President of Albania, he visited Serbia with no problem. So whatever he said, he was full of provocation. He wanted to create, uh, of course, bigger Albania, and nobody in Serbia. Uh, did not even mention that. So Vucic was in Kosovo. He was uh, stopped by war criminals, by Lashtaku, Getty, Ladrovci, and, and others. And we know all these guys, sooner or later, they're going to finish, uh, they're going to face the justice. So uh, talking about army again, you know, the Kosovo have already defense, defense forces. This is the army. So uh, why now they are rushing? What is the reason for rush? I don't see the rush. Uh, and uh, let's calm down. Let's see how we can work together. Let's wait some new generation of the people after a, a, a tribunal for uh, a KLA of full, uh, become fully operational. And also, you can see our friend in Kosovo. He's always constantly mentioning Kosovo. Now you call him from Turkey. Go to Ottoman Museum. And you will see Kosovo, not Kosovo. Okay. okay, well, hold on. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Darko. Okay, so ethnic Serbs, you call it Kosovo, they call it Kosovo. End of story. Are you it's a Turkish different discussion. Are you it's a, it's, I'm are not you Turkish. Turkish I'm not Turkish, and we're doing a program to the rest of the world here. Libun, to address the point of calm down, doesn't the man make a point? He's saying, take it easy. Why now? Why rush? And again, it goes back to what NATO's saying. Okay, we agree with you, but why do it right now? Well, why not now? Well, it is, it's going to remain the same thing. It's just, just as I mentioned, it is just uh, an advancing concerning, concerning the sovereignty of, of Kosovo. And, and what, is, what does that mean? Why is that a problem? Uh, so, according to Constitution, it is still going to be the same forces. They are just going to be advanced in a number from 2,500 to 5,000 within 10 years. So, each year, they're going to be 250 uh, soldiers more and uh, members more and uh, in the by the end by the end of after 10 years there are going to be about 5000 mm -hmm. troops and on the other aspects everything is remaining the same except the aspect of sovereignty and uh, what does 
that make a problem. That is one. And the second thing, uh, when Vucic was in Kosovo, he was prizing Milosevic. We know Milosevic, who, who he was. Mm -hmm. And we have been facing him. We have been facing the entire the army of Yugoslavia and Serbia since 2012 that have, have never had any changes from time to time. And uh, we shouldn't ever uh, forget what happened here during the Milosevic period. And when the existing president of Serbia is coming to Kosovo and prizing him and say, saying even that he has made just few little, few mistakes, that is a great, but, that is a great problem. He's a, a very clear signal from the Serbian side toward, toward Kosovo. Okay. Things not fully resolved. Still a lot of tension. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Libun Aliu and Darko Trifunovic, I thank you for joining us on the Newsmakers. It was important to get the two of you together. Thanks again. You address me as Mr. Correctional Officer. Mr. Correctional Officer, the guards and the experimenters are clearly in violation of the rules set up for this experiment, and I refuse to endorse an unfair system. It's considered the best-known psychology study of all time, the Stanford Prison Experiment in the 1970s, put students into a mock jail and left them to their own devices. The study is featured in films and taught in high schools. Guards became treacherous and terrified prisoners who revolted. Researchers concluded that human behavior is affected by the roles people are given and that, more disturbingly, we are all just degrees away from becoming really, really sadistic. Well, that study has now come under new scrutiny. And to talk about that is the famed psychologist behind the experiment, Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Sir, it's an honor talking to you. I don't know how many conversations I've had about you over the past, I don't know, 15 years or so. So it's good to talk to you on the program. Good. Now, your work inspired a lot of discussion about the fact that we're all almost just degrees away from, from being like Nazis, right? Given the right circumstances and so forth, given the right prods and pushes in the right or wrong context. But now there's research coming out that's hanging a question mark over your Stanford right. prison experiment. First of all, before I look at some of the claims, are any of them credible? No. Why do you the think they're questioning answer, it? I have, no, <clears throat> I have no idea why suddenly in June of this year, uh, there were a number of bloggers mm -hmm. who started criticizing the Stanford Prison Study, saying they had discovered uh, things that were had been concealed. And that turns out to be all false, because after I finished the, the study, and then I wrote the book, The Lucifer Effect, in 2007, at that moment, <clears throat> I donated to the Stanford Historical Society mm -hmm. all of the material that I had in that study, 14 hours of videotapes, 30 hours of audio tapes, all of the records, all the observations, they are on in, in right. deposit at the Stanford Historical Society and they have all been digitized and are available for anyone in the world free. So these, these bloggers say they have discovered something that was concealed, but that's a lie. Right. Everything they discovered are things that I deposited uh, in the Stanford Historical Society. And it's a credit to your transparency that it's all there and people can, can, can look into it if they want to, right? So let, anyway. me, just, let, so let me just summarize some of, the, some of the claims here. So we have sure. uh, Alex Haslam's team at the University of Queensland. They say David Jaffe, who was your collaborator in running the experiment, he sort of pushed and prodded a lot of these, these guards into committing these acts, right? So they hang a question mark over what you, uh, what you came out with. Okay. Ben Bloom in Medium, he wrote about it. He said, the Stanford Prison Experiment is a sham and a lie. He called what you, what you did a fraud. Gina Perry in New Scientist said this was more showbiz than science. And then there's a French author, Thibault Latessier, that said yeah, right. that uh, your claims were overblown and your findings hollow. So they're saying, well, okay, everything that you said happened, happened, but they feel that you didn't really set the parameters and then press play and let things just unfold organically. You guys were pushing for a result. Is there any truth to that? No, there's no truth to that. That's what I said is that, <clears throat> I mean, 
<clears throat> I should say first for your listeners, I have responded in a 22 page rebuttal mm -hmm. to every single critique uh, that the, they raise and others. Um, because I'm really concerned about the legacy of this experiment. In three years, it will be 50 year anniversary of the Stanford prison experiment. And the reason it's important is simply that it's the most unique and powerful demonstration of how situations, social situations, can push good people to behave badly. And, 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 and therefore, the extension of that is, if we put ordinary people into positive situations, then I know that we can create heroes rather than villains. So, it, so the, the, that's the basic message. And that's why I care about it after right. all these years. Might it be that perhaps it, it might both be true, that you're, you're absolutely right that this is what we're capable of as, as human beings, but the experiment itself might have been flawed in some way, and 50 years later you can say maybe we didn't do it in the, in the most ideal way. No. <laughs> okay, what is unique about the Stanford Prison Experiment is that all other research in the history of psychology goes for one hour. This was 24-7. Prisoners lived in their cells night and day. Uh, guards worked eight-hour shifts. So because of that, uh, and because of the videos we made, you can see the transformation of character, which is not possible in a one-hour study. The other comparable study is by Stanley Milgram, uh, in, in the 1960s called Blind Obedience to Authority. But Stanley Milgram's study showed that individuals can be corrupted by powerful mm. authorities to do bad things. And, but again, his study was only a single hour. Right. So the drama in, in my research is that we can see the gradual uh, transformation of co bright, intelligent college students becoming prisoners, becoming guards in their minds. Uh, and we did not push it. Now, the crit I should say, uh, when I said earlier that I, I wrote a 22-page rebuttal, mm -hmm. it's available to anyone on prisonexp.org. Okay. So that's the site of everything about the prison study. And so if you go to prisonexp.org, you'll see my rebuttal. And it, so each thing, so let's say the thing you just mentioned about um, uh, David Jaffe, who right. was a student playing the role of warden. He told one guard who was doing nothing, who was sitting uh, n n doing nothing, that you're getting paid to be a guard. So act like a guard. Uh, he, didn't he didn't tell anybody else. He told a single uh, student who was role playing a guard that your job is you're getting paid to be a guard. Right. And, and that's for me, that's reasonable. And that was that was on day one when the study began. Right. And never again after that did we have to tell the guards what to do. Yeah. So for the critics. David Jaffe was essentially that man in a lab coat or that woman in a lab coat in Milgram's experiment saying, please press the button, please press the button, listen to me, please press the button. They, they feel that you added an authority figure within the experiment. Tell me why you think that's unfair. No. Yes, he played the role of warden. I played the role of superintendent. The warden's job was to see, it, as in a real prison, that the guards are doing their, what they are paid for. Mm -hmm. If you are a prison guard, it's a job. And your job is to maintain law and order in the prison, see that the prisoners uh, uh, do not rebel or escape. And as I said, and you, you're not listening, he told one guard on day one that he was not doing his job and that in order for him to continue to be a guard, he has to play the role of guard. Mm -hmm. And that was one guard on day one. He didn't, we didn't say that to anybody else any other time. Yeah, and I, and I see so that- I, I think so, you're making too much- No, I'm, and, and the reason I'm, I'm drilling down and, I, and I'm pushing is to get absolutely yeah. clar uh, absolute clarity here, right? Because I see that, you know, you, as you said, you put out a 22 page rebuttal, right? And I encourage our viewers to go to prisonexp.org. And the reason I push and I ask is because for a lot of people, from people who get their education from YouTube, I guess, such as myself, to people who do Psych 101, to people who do this to PhD level, this is a foundation stone in understanding Abu Ghraib, in understanding the Nazis, in understanding the killing fields, in understanding right. the banality of evil, as Hannah Arendt 
put it, right? And for a lot of them, if they see the headlines or if they just scroll through their Twitter feed and they see a headline that says that Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment, that very experiment that you just saw showcased, uh, played by Billy, Billy Crudup in that, in that last movie, that thing might not be the real deal. Does that rock the foundation of everything you've done and all the conclusions that you came, uh, you came out with over the past 50 years? No. <laughs> I don't understand what you're doing. I'm telling you that none of those criticisms are valid, not a single one. You know, again, one of them say that the boy who, um, prison 8612, the first one who had an emotional breakdown, that he was faking. I, I not only challenge that, I present a video that we, that he made afterwards saying that, that uh, he was ashamed of losing control over himself that uh, he was he was embarrassed that he lost control, that he became a psychologist, a prison psychologist, uh, uh, Doug Corpy, 8612, in order to understand his mind better. So that's not faking it. Yeah. And, but I'm saying, it's not that I just said it. We have a video of him right. saying it. Dr. Zimbardo, I know you don't believe me, but I'm a big fan. And I read The Lucifer Effect, and it's a fantastic book. And I... Thank you. I appreciate and, and And I appreciate you coming onto the show to clarify and push back against these criticisms. Thanks for joining us here on The Newsmakers, Dr. Philip Zimbardo. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.